Well, on Sunday, celebrations erupted at Standing Rock after the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers announced it denied the Nakoda Access Pipeline Company a permit to build the final segment of the $3.8 billion project that would study a possible reroute of the pipeline. This is Knupa Hanska Luger. I, I think. I think this sort of opportunity here, the thing that has happened here is that we've recognized that we have agency. We've given a lot of our power to, to other entities saying, please help us, please save us. But when we come together as living things, as people, well, then suddenly we recognize that we have, we have power. And that's what this country was supposed to be built about. That's what we were supposed to be uh, promised from before. And so, you know, whoever's president, we're human beings. We're the people. We're the reason. We're the living things here, you know? And hopefully that will move forward and uh, can be shared. I mean, if you look down the road here, there are lights as far as the eye can see. People have come to this place to recognize that we have agency. You know, we have power. And when we come together, we recognize it's easier to share. Mindy, what's your name? <laughs> it's easier to share than it is to take away. You know, sharing is so much easier. I just got a kiss from that guy. Yeah. It was easy. I just stood here. But what alternate routes would be considered? What will the process of an environmental impact statement look like? Can this decision be reversed once President-elect Donald Trump takes office? And what's next for the resistance movement? To answer some of these questions, we're joined by Tara Hauska, National Campaigns Director for Honor the Earth. She's Ojibwe from Kuchiching First Nation. Um, we saw her both times we were in North Dakota, um, and she joined us on our show. Uh, Tara, welcome back to Democracy Now! First, where were you when the news came down yesterday, and what's your response? Um, I was actually, uh, I, I got a call from some of the big greens that um, this, this call with the White House had taken place, and um, immediately got into my vehicle and went out to camp. Um, I happened to be in service. I was actually driving uh, down Highway 6 um, instead of 1806, which remains blockaded. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible, incredible moment of grassroots organizing, reaching the highest levels of government and effectuating change. Um, we saw that with the um, entire like review of this permitting process, that was a huge win, but it was specific to this project. Now we're seeing this, um, you know, decision not to grant an easement under Lake Oahe and to um, look into an environmental impact statement, which is what the tribe has asked for all along. Now, the energy transfer partner says they're moving ahead. They actually don't need this permit to build. What's your response to them? And are you concerned that the chairman says there's no way they can build right now, that they will move forward? You know, it, it's really not surprising to hear energy transfer partners say those things, um, seeing as they openly stated in federal court, um, Dakota Access, his attorney, stated that the permit was a formality. Um, and the judge said, you know, well, it's clearly not a formality now, is it? Um, so they kind of have this very arrogant attitude of uh, what they believe to be a rubber stamping process to so their incredibly destructive project. Um, you know, I, if Energy Transfer Partners is, is planning to proceed without a permit and be in total flagrant violation of the law, then I would want to know, you know, what's the um, administration's response to protecting, protecting the lands, you know, protecting the public interest? That's what environmental impact statement is, is about. Um, if someone's violating the law, they're, they're tasked with enforcing it. Um, so I wonder if federal marshals are going to be sent out or how the Army Corps intends to address a violator of that nature. So what about this uh, rerouting idea, the rerouting of the pipeline and the environmental impact statement process? Yeah, um, you know, one part of this process that's been very difficult for me is I actually worked at uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality as an intern, which is tasked with uh, NEPA, administrating NEPA. Um, so an EIS considers, you know, different, it'll consider alternate routes, it'll consider a no-build option, um, all of these different things that should have been done in the first place for a 1,200, almost 1,200-mile pipeline. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this impact statement is done. It's done very effectively, and it's done uh, very all-encompassing, which is what they're supposed to do, you know, cumulative impacts considered. It sounds like they're just going to use do an impact statement on just that one little piece um, and that one little crossing instead of doing a cumulative impact statement. Um, 
And that's very unfortunate that they continue to use the use nationwide permit 12, but I hope it opens the door to more litigation to, you know, taking that, that part out of the process. Um, uh, what happens with uh, Donald Trump administration when he becomes president, who said he supports the pipeline? Can he just reverse all of this? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a that's a reality of, you know, this victory is, I think, a momentous occasion of um, feeling the power of the people. But at the same time, we're very aware that the next president coming in is um, in support of Dakota Access and will probably, you know, just cancel whatever environmental impact statement is, is, is in progress and uh, attempt to push this pipeline through. And that's where I think, you know, it's really incumbent on us to remain vigilant, to um, recognize the power that's within us of organizing and um, coming together. You know, this wasn't just indigenous people. This was people from all nations that came together um, in support of the water and support of future generations, because this is an issue that affects us all. Does the energy so, transfer partners lose something by not building by January 1st? They do. You know, as this pro they, they recently just brought a suit in court saying that, you know, so far we've cost them $100 million, that the demonstrations against um, their their project has cost them have cost them dearly. And, you know, it's, it's a reality that this will eventually become a stranded asset. So, you know, if they can't reach their January 1st build deadlines and, you know, are forced to push this project back, I hope that many of their funding partners, which we have, you know, looked at, and we know um, there's a full list of them, and people have gone and done direct action, nonviolent direct action at those places, don't support a project that Im impacts negatively so many people. There's 17 million people that live along the Missouri River. This is um, indigenous lands. This is uh, sacred sites being destroyed. No, part, no investor should want to be part of a project like that. Move to renewable energy. Finally, what are you saying about the resistance camps? There are thousands of people near um, that who are there. The chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Dave Archambault, says now you can go home and enjoy your winters at home because this pipeline at this point cannot move forward. Do you feel the same way? Um, you know, I feel like I think it's you know the response of the administration from President Obama was due to a lot of pressure. You know, they put out this this Army Corps letter saying that they were going to treat Indigenous people as trespassers on treaty lands. More people came. Uh, they said they were going to subject us to local law enforcement. More people came. Um, the veterans all showed up, you know, thousands and thousands of people to, to effectuate this change. Um, and so knowing that the Trump administration is coming in, this fight is not over. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I think maybe people might need a break. Some, some folks probably need to go home and re, recant, like, you know, regroup after such violations have happened, you know, really violent altercations on behalf of the police. And, um, you know, I, I think that we need to remain vigilant at the same time and know that this, this could happen um, in just a few short months. Tara Housko, I want to thank you for being with us, National Campaigns Director for Honor the Earth. She's Ojibwe from Cochiching First Nation, has been living in North Dakota now for many months. You're not actually at the resistance camp now. You're in Mandan at the Honor the Earth jail support house. Very quickly, in 20 seconds, are there anyone, is there anyone else in jail now who is arrested for protesting um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, the jail being in Mandan, where you are? Red Fawn remains in, in, in incarceration. Uh, she was a woman that was originally charged with attempted murder. Uh, the prosecutor had to drop that charge, and now they're, they're charging her with felony possession of a weapon. So her, her case remains ongoing. But there have been over 500 charges brought, so we have a, a long road in front of us to actually defend these folks. Tara Haska is also an indigenous lawyer. Well, we're